Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I'm joined by author and journalist Peter Stothard. Peter was editor of The Times and of The Times Literary Supplement. He's an author of ancient history and memoirs. And his previous books include The Last Assassin, The Hunt for the Killers of Julius Caesar, Alexandria, The Last Knights of Cleopatra, and On the Spartacus Road, A Spectacular Journey Through Ancient Italy. But today, though, we are joined by Peter to chat all about his new book, Palatine, An Alternative History of the Caesars, published by Oxford University Press. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about your new book. Um, so why don't we start off by you telling us what your new book is all about? This is a book that is the the view of an important period of Roman history that the Roman historian didn't want us to see. Uh, the the Most of the historians of, of ancient Rome were essentially quite a traditional conservative upper class types. And when the, um, the Roman Empire emerged from the old system where the aristocrats had done very nicely, it produced uh, a whole lot of new powerful people because the, the, the power in Rome moved from the forum that everybody knows about where people made great speeches and were, and were competing for votes um, inside effectively a single house. And that single house was on the Palatine Hill and became the Palatine. And the Palatine is the, the name that became afterwards used for every palace that there ever was. That's, that was, Palatine was the first palace. But inside that house, um, a totally new set of people had power. So a lot of um, Romans didn't take much notice of the views of enslaved people uh, in, in any way. Um, and then suddenly they found that inside this house of power, the Palatine, there were some very, very influential slaves and also a lot of even more influential ex-slaves who were doing the jobs that previously they'd have thought um, they should have been doing. And um, there were some suddenly, because it was a house and a home, uh, there were a lot of very powerful women doing things that, that nobody quite knew what they were doing. Um, maybe they were exaggerating, maybe they weren't, and they were quite sure exactly what was going on. But what people realised was that this something was was changing here in terms of who controlled what was going on, and so, and these people, these uh, slaves, ex-slaves, um, the women, the cooks, the the the, uh, the food tasters, the um, the guards, all these people who tend to be sort of patronised in traditional uh, history because the, the the Romans who were writing the history didn't like it. Um, actually were extremely uh, important people suddenly. And it's worth, I think, looking at looking at this period, this longish period of the heirs of Julius Caesar from um, from Augustus to uh, to Nero and then the chaos that happened after that, to, to look at it through the eyes of these courtiers, you know, these uh, people who were, were looked down on, were considered sort of, I mean, the main character in my book, a man called Aulus Vitellius, was really, you know, denigrated through whole history just for being fat and a glutton and a kind of general bad guy. Now, I'm not saying he was, a, I'm no part of my book is to say that he was a great guy or that his father was a great guy or that they were all wonderful. But it's worth looking at them again, not through the eyes of someone who is bound, who is sort of committed to thinking that they're rubbish. Oh, yeah, no, I think that's incredible that you're coming to these very well-known figures, potentially from a, a completely different angle. So you're coming to, so you're looking at uh, influential figures, um, high up figures, emperors um, that we are obviously very aware of, but you're coming to them from a different point of view. What kind, how, how did you get that sort of information? What, what's available to you from these new points of view? At the end of this period of the Caesars, after Nero, you remember Nero, but by the time that Nero was dead, virtually everybody who was an heir of Julius Caesar, who was even half plausible to be an emperor, was already been had already been killed, and so there weren't really any Caesars, old Caesars left. And uh, so when uh, Jul uh, Nero's advisors and staff 
who were rather less effective than some of the advisors and staff of the early, earlier emperors. All, all, all Nero wanted them to do really was to clap when he performed and when he sang, you know. So that wasn't much use when there was a revolt turned up in Gaul. <laughs> a lot of soldiers marching towards you. You find you had this very good uh, Praetorian guard of um, acrobats and, and, and dancers and uh, um, people who, who thought that your singing voice was terrific. So, so, uh, so Nero uh, was forced to commit suicide, and after that, um, it was pretty much a, a open season, and there were four emperors in one year. Now, it happened that one of those emperors, the Emperor um, Vitellius, was the son and grandson of a, a courtier family. So the, my aim in Palatine is to trace the history of the Caesars, what's why it's called an alternative history of the Caesars, through this family of bureaucrats, courtiers, flatterers, gluttons, call them what you, you like, um, who ended up briefly with one of theirs, completely unexpectedly. Aulus Vitellius was probably the last person that anybody expected to become emperor, particularly Aulus Vitellius. His mother had a particularly dim view of his prospects of, 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 of ever doing anything like at all, uh, uh, at all, which is unusual for Roman mothers because they were normally very keen on advancing their sons. Um, Vitellius's mother was, was thought that this was a really bad idea. <laughs> and so, but we do know quite a bit about Vitellius. Once you became a Roman emperor, you got a biography by Suetonius, and people started taking a note of what you were what you were doing. So the historians do write about you, and because his father was an extremely influential um, courtier, in, in particularly in the, in the in the reign of in the reign of, Claudi of Claudius. Um, uh, we do know quite a bit about him, about about him too, and we can piece together the story of this family, which was very different from the grand families of Rome, but who was very very important in, in during the time of the Caesars. How brilliant! It's almost like um, a piece that hasn't yet been fitted into this grand, you know, um, knowledge of of the early emperors. So, why did you decide to write this particular book and this alternative history um, of the Caesars? Well, I thought this was a story that ne needed needed to be told uh, with with some sort of relevance to our own time. You know, if you look at your look at your own time in in Britain, perhaps more more than in America, but the notion of the sort of the, the downwardly mobile aristocrats, the uh, in, the incoming, uh, the, the the newcomers, the uh, from abroad, the immigrants, um, people from you know different cultures who were looked down on, and then suddenly they turn out to be extremely uh, extremely powerful. Um, it, it, and also, what was the real legacy of Rome? I mean, we talk about, you know, we look at the aqueducts and we read the poetry and, you know, people still study, you know, um, the sort of moral examples of, uh, of Roman uh, behaviour, normally very individualistic, almost always male behaviour. Uh, and so that's what we think of as the, uh, as the legacy of Rome. But in, in, in many ways, the, the birth of Western bureaucracy was as important a legacy of Rome as, as, as any other. And this bureaucracy was born on the, Palat on the Palatine Hill. Um, and it's cast with a kind of chorus line in politics who, you know, some of whom occasionally very briefly became stars. But even when they weren't stars, were very important for keeping the show on the road. So you were doing research on all these different people who all, they all sound very unique. Um, did you have a favourite? All of Vitellius' father, this man, uh, Lucius Vitellius, is a rather amazing uh, character because he was a, essentially a professional flatterer. And they were the, uh, another lot of people who were looked down on. There was a lot about flattery and gluttony in this book. These were two crimes from the point of view of many people writing about politics at the time and, and since. You know, gluttony meant lack of self-control and uh, the Emperor Vitellius was a famous glutton. And, and you have to ask yourself, well, I'm sure he wasn't, he wasn't a particularly nice guy. You say a favourite guy, probably the son wasn't exactly a favourite. On the other hand, when you're calling someone fat, you just sort of, it's almost kind of fat shaming, really. Um, is it because they actually were fat or just because you had some other reason for saying you didn't like you didn't like them, and and, and the father who um, I don't think was fat I think he probably was far thin but but uh, we don't know but um, 
he uh, he was famous as a flatterer, and he was he was the guy who went who when Messalina was Claudius's wife, um, you know was um, needed everybody to say how wonderful she was. Carried her slipper around and would occasionally kiss it, you know. And he and he was the one who when um, the Emperor Caligula said, uh, "I'm I'm um, talking to the moon." Can you see me talking to the moon? Caligula believed or may have believed that he was a kind of god, or at least he used that to test people. Very clever thing for Caligula to say to Vitellius. Most people would fail this test and say, yes, I can see you talking to the moon, your highness. And at that point, Caligula could say, well, who else is there? And then laugh when he, you know, the guy had dug himself into a, deep, into a deep hole. Or if he said he didn't see uh, Caligula talking to the moon, um, Caligula would get very cross and say, well, are you suggesting I'm not a god? But uh, Lucius Vitellius was a very smart flatterer, and he came up with the answer, I know, I can't see you talking to the moon, sir, because only gods can see other gods. This was a very smart um, response and, made, um, and meant that he was a much better flatterer w uh, than um, the other ones who often ended up in a rather um, unpleasant uh, places, having very nasty things done to them. So um, Vitellius was a man of extremely quick wit. Um, who was attacked because he was a flatterer, but flattery was really important in the court in order to make it work. And his son, Aulus Vitellius, the emperor, was, um, say, fat-shamed, um, probably was a, a terrible glutton, and he does extraordinary stories indeed about his food. But I think it's worth asking, if you're writing writing a book and really trying to see what had actually happened, you know, why did they think he was a, a, a glutton? What, was he really so different from everybody else? And if he was different... Um, why was he different? And if he wasn't that different, well, why is why, why are we shaming him rather than other people? All these are based on the notion that, say, flattery and gluttony are just two of the things all of us, I think, you can recognise in any kind of bureaucracy. You know, the eating to excess and saying things that you don't believe to people who are superior to you are quite important to the way, making the way, making the place work. And if you're going to understand how the thing works, which is what historians are supposed to do, this was this was worth investigating. Absolutely. So now everyone knows when they're reading your book to expect flattery and gluttony as the two main things <laughs> running through it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so it sounds like it would have been a, a lot of fun doing research for this for this particular book um did you find as you're working through the research anything particularly surprising um or fascinating that you didn't know before i think um it's worth saying that the um research for ancient history is slightly different than say research for for modern history Re research in ancient history rarely means going through but never really means going through archives that people haven't looked at before we know we do know a lot about this period in fact but it's all it's none of it uh, is uh, is new i mean occasionally you discover an inscription or something on a tombstone or something rarely very important actually um the most the point about you call it research is is looking at the material that we have and and trying to to, to look behind the material and also looking at it a different way than people have looked at it before not just for the sake of novelty, but because everybody brings their own prejudices to the sources that you've got, the research that you've got. They, they know what they're looking for. You know, so many people investigated Roman history in order to defend the British Empire. You know, the Romans had a very successful empire. Um, we had a very successful empire. Uh, good idea to, you know, to... to a bit of Roman discipline to be employed in the, in the, in the British Empire, and uh, and that's why it was worth studying. And they were, you know, they were good people, and they um, attacked barbarians, and they generally went tramped around um, taking things from other people. And if you want to, you know, a lot of people <laughs> studied Roman history to justify precisely doing that. And uh, there are lots of other reasons. I mean, good reasons and less good reasons. But what I, I was so, so I was just trying to apply what I hope is a a, a modern sensibility to a story so that you see it in, in a, a fresh way. Brilliant. I love that. Um, okay. So probably the last question that I have is what do you think people should know about either the topic as a whole or your book more specifically? Well, I hope when they've, when they've read it, um, everybody has said that it's a, 
a, a good read and uh, and that you will um get a, a take on a, a period of history that you thought you knew or thought you knew some of even if it's only from movies and a bit of a bit of shakespeare and uh, perhaps you know robert graves and i mean there are pe people who've done this big figures who've looked at this period i'm not um, no one would deny that but i hope that you people will see it in a, in, in a different way and see that the um, that the legacy of rome um, isn't quite as simple as they as, as they thought it was and the aspects of their own lives um, at, at our own times are just as much part of the legacy of ancient Rome as some of the Victorian values and traditional ideas that poss possibly put them off studying Roman history in the first place. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining me today. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, if anyone wants to purchase the book, you'll be able to find a link down below um, for Oxford Uni University Press. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Kelly. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my sweater, you can find this design and a bunch more in our shop at worldhistory.store, or you can find a link for it down below. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you soon with another video. Bye.